Ja, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, ich darf Sie recht... Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you very cordially. We would like to start now. I'd also like to welcome those who are joining us online. These times are moving times, and I already heard that some people did not make it here because of new protests, this time not of farmers, but of truck drivers. So this is basically Berlin. But still, we are very happy that you are here. Um, to discuss one of the topics that led to heavy discussions uh, at the European level, which is the reduction of pesticide use, and can we afford to continue with business as usual in the agro uh, sector? That's the question. My name is Martin Häusling. I've been a European parliamentarian since 2009. I'm part of the Agricultural uh, Committee there, a uh, member of the Greens uh, group there, and um, heavily involved in the reduction of pesticides and this topic. So, of course, we had discussions about this ZUR topic, S-U-R. So, We'll just wait for another second. So we got a proposal from the Commission in the course of the Farm to Fork strategy that pesticide reduction would have been one of the objectives of the European Union. And it said by the year 2030, 50% less pesticides as a target for the agricultural sector. And there was a heavy reply from the farming sector who said, well, this is not possible. The farmers were fearing for their yields. And I think what the commission did wrong, and this is also what we heard in the discussion process several times, and we said it also there, is that one should have explained why do we need this reduction in pesticides? Why is it important that we use less pesticides in the long run? Of course, this has something to do with the fact that we are suffering uh, severe consequences in terms of biodiversity loss, not least since the Krefeld study, which shows that we had a decline of insects by 20 percent, insect species. So this is something that eventually will affect all of us in our lives. And I think this has been lost in the whole debate. Everyone thought, well, this is just a political objective, but why do we need to reduce the, the amount of pesticides that is being used to that extent. So in the whole discussion, nobody managed to explain it to the farmers that we can do it with less pesticides and we have to use less pesticides. So the interesting thing is that um, I think six or seven years ago, there was a French study which said 40% of the pesticides used do not make economic sense for the farmers they do not create a value added. And I think this already makes clear that through different processes in the agricultural and the farming, um, one could do without much of the pesticides. And the second thing is that in the course of um, cultivating uh, when you use resistant uh, species, for example, um, then we could also, resistant varieties, we could also do with less pesticides. So what eventually happened in the course of the discussion in terms of the pesticide reduction is really a drama. My colleague, Saravina, got the dossier and she managed to achieve good agreements in the Environmental Committee. But in the end, the conservative majority uh, and some liberals completely tore this draft apart, rejected it, and eventually we also had to say we are not going to pass this law because it's of no effect anymore because everything was diluted. So it's quite sad. The conservatives considered it a major success of the farmers. Yes, we can continue with business as usual, but I think this was a huge mistake because we cannot continue with business as usual. You might remember the Montreal Protocol. We in Europe also committed ourselves to um, apply nature conservation rules to large areas, stricter rules than at the moment, and I 
usually say, if we in Europe are not able to implement these regulations, if we meet so much resistance, how do we want to explain to countries of the global south that they should stop utilizing all the pesticides. So we have a huge responsibility here in Europe to show a path towards a pesticide-free agriculture. And a second aspect that we will also hear in the discussion, and this leads to a lack of credibility of the European Union. We ban many chemicals in Europe, rightly so, but at the same time, we are exporting these chemicals to the global south. So the justification sometimes is quite strange. Sometimes it's being said, well, in tropical countries, we need different plant varieties and a different kind of protection, um, different pesticides. So um, there are alleged pests that are suddenly becoming a problem there. But we ban pesticides to protect people here, but at the same time export it by BASF, Syngenta, and others. They still export these pesticides and do business to the detriment of the environment and the people in the global south. This is not acceptable. And that we do not manage in Europe to self-assert that the federal government does not manage to implement this export ban is quite a scandal, actually. So I do not want to mention a party which is specifically responsible for it, but you can all, I mean, yes. Um, so I do not want to extemporize, but I hope uh, that this event will allow us to achieve our target of a reduction of pesticides and that it hopefully remains a major target in the European Union and also for the next commission. We are heading towards elections in Europe, and I think that civil society has to make clear that we cannot continue with business as usual. And the farmers are now in this victim role that they um, chose for themselves. But, um, of course, they we should... Um, appreciate if they reduce uh, pesticides and reward them for it. And I hope that we can implement it in the next parliament um, after the election. So now I wish you an interesting um, event. And I pass the floor to Lena Luik for the moderation. She's going to be your host. So, thank you very much, Martin, Lena Luig. I'm a spokesperson for International Agricultural Policy at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. I'm quite happy that you are here with us, that we can conduct this event together. And Martin has already brought up many aspects, what we want to discuss, pesticide reduction at the EU level uh, in order to get rid of the double standards in the global pesticide trade. And we will also talk about the glyphosate phase out which actually failed at EU level uh, initially. So, so there are so many topics on the table evolving around pesticides. So I think we will have a very interesting debate today. So first of all, I would like to uh, ask the other panelists to come to the podium. First of all, Carsten Rocholl, I would like to ask you to come here. He is a geographer and a member of the Member of Parliament, Volker Wille in NRW, Federal State in Germany, and on behalf of the Green uh, Caucus in the European Parliament. He published the study Gone is Gone, why there is no alternative to preserving biodiversity. So he's the co-author of that study. And he will go more into detail uh, in a moment. And he's been working in research a team for more than 20 years where it is about marine mammals. And we will hear more about that later on. Carsten, it's great that we are having it. can have you here. Then I would also like to ask Susan Huffmans to come to the panel. She is an agricultural engineer and spokesperson for pesticides at the PAN Germany, the Pesticide Action Network. And she has looked into the global pesticide trade and possibilities for regulation. So thank you very much for coming in, Susan. Then I would like to ask Silke Bollmore to come to the podium. She's a spokesperson for global um, food and agriculture at the Incorta network. And in the past, she 
worked as an eco-toxicologist on pesticides in Kenya, South Africa. She also worked as an advisor in this regard, and she's got a lot of expertise in this uh, area. So welcome to you. And Larissa Bombardi. Larissa came from Brussels. Uh, she's a geographer at the University of Sao Paulo, actually, in Brazil. But she's been living in, in Brussels. Brussels since the Bolsonaro government, the right wing uh, Bolsonaro government, and does research on double standards, especially between the EU and Brazil. So thank you very much for being here, Larissa. And I, unfortunately, I have to say that someone is missing. We tried to get a, a replacement from the uh, Agricultural Ministry uh, to join us in the discussion. Unfortunately, we did not manage to do that. So Martin is here basically the representative of uh, the political side. We would have liked to have a national perspective as well. But I think that many people in this round will also um, take along and pass on the things that we discuss here. So we will have short key statements or impulse statements. Uh, Susan Hafmans will begin. Susan will give us an overview over the pesticide utilization in Germany and the EU, and especially on the question, why do we need a strong pesticide regulation in the EU and Germany? Susan, you have the floor. Thank you very much. There are also a few slides, and we can wait for them. So maybe the next slide. Oh, okay, I can do it myself. Okay. Red is the next slide. Okay. So why do we need a strong pesticide regulation in the EU? Well, this is the question that is actually up on the table for discussion. I would say pesticide regulation and pesticide reduction is not an end in itself, and Martin has already mentioned it. It is about an important thing. Pesticides have an effect, and this effect are no longer born or can no longer be born by our planetary boundaries. And we can see it. I mean, if we do not have a strict regulation, and if we do not reduce the amount of chemical pesticides, then we put at risk our agriculture. We take away the possibility of future generations to have a sustainable agriculture in the future. Also, that um, agriculture can also bet on um, animals that are needed on beneficial insects. We know that pesticides are an important driver of the loss of species. And if they are lost, they will not return. And if soils are overburdened, I mean, we want to reduce chemical burdening of soils, air, and water, and we have to do it. The situation is dire, is not looking good. And the concentrations of pesticides do have an impact. So uh, I'm going to turn around from time to time here because the monitors are off. Um, I just want to emphasize that we have a human right on a healthy environment. It's not something that we where we can say, oh, I'd like to have this. I mean, this is really our right, and we owe it to us and our future generations that we act. And as we will look more into biodiversity in the next talk, I would like to look at the water now, which is not in a good state. We know that the groundwater is um, contaminated. 40% of the measuring sites have exceeded the amount of allowed pesticides. The water treatment facilities um, are alarming us through the small water site monitoring, we got an insight into the actual burdening of uh, the water sites. And 80% of the sites that were measured are surpassing any threshold value. And this is not a situation which has an impact on the chemical burdening. It has an impact on the um, biological uh, aspects, on the zoonotic diseases. And we know that the acceptable value 
uh, that has been determined as way too high. So many organisms are already damaged at much lower values. And the other thing is that these thresholds are being surpassed, are being violated. And what is a pesticide regulation? So in general, we can say it is the whole area of approval, approval processes, which is being dealt with at the EU level. So there's an assessment of the effectiveness of um, substances and what kind of risks do they entail. And the other aspect is the application. So when we use what and to what extent and what kind of restrictions do we need and what kind of prioritizations do we want to set. And if we look at the impact on biodiversity, and this is a slide from the expert council on environmental questions to see the impact of pesticides, um, we have target organisms, pests that we want to do away with, and we want to protect the cultivated crops. And then we have all the undesired effects and what we can see here, crossed out in red, I mean, there are also other um, annotations, but this is basically something that the risk assessment does not include in the approval process. So this is the impact on the environment. What if the plant dies, if there's no flower anymore, if the bees cannot find food and the birds do not find sufficient insects? So all the follow-up consequences are not being assessed and investigate it. And what we can see here <coughs> is um, we check and we review, but the problems remain. And if you look at it, 80 years of chemical plant protection, you can see that with good conscience, pesticides, groups of pesticides were approved. And in the course of the open air tests, so to speak, one could see, oh, it's highly toxical. We have people who are being poisoned by it. It um, amounts in the body. We have uh, contaminated water. We have to close wells and whatever. Um, there's anthracene, for example. There are substances that are detrimental to the environment. And everything or, or something that every one of you might have uh, heard about are the neonicotinoids, which have a detrimental impact on pollinators. And um, But how about tomorrow? Uh, we cannot be that hopeful that a future pesticide approval process might solve all the existing problems. And this is why we will never be able to rely on the approval process alone. I mean, we can improve the approval process. But we cannot rely on the approval process. We also need other safeguards, so to speak. We have to um, take a pre preventive measures, so to speak. At the moment, we are always lagging behind. We see in terms of the application that for quite a long time, we have certain regulations which actually should uh, be implemented since 2009 in order to reduce the risks posed by pesticides and should also reduce the impact on the health of human beings and the negative impact on the environment. And um, if we look around, then we have huge doubts that this has worked out at all, and it didn't work out. And also the Commission after an evaluation said, well, it's not working. And this is why the Commission said we cannot only rely on voluntary self-commitments. We need to have mandatory commitments. We have to turn a guideline into a regulation. So this is actually what we are trying to do with the sustainable use regulation. And this is heavily um, debated, as we've already heard, and we are running the risk of no implementation at all or such a heavy dilution that we do not have anything um, that is better than what we have at the moment. Uh, so to come back to it, we need a strong pesticide regulation. So what does it mean? So all in all, we have to take preventive measures. We have to uh, commit ourselves 
to it, to the precautionary measure. We have this obligation towards the environment, towards human beings, and also beyond our own borders. And the most detrimental pesticides should not be put on the market. The highly hazardous uh, pesticides should not be put on the market. Um, indirect effects on biological diversity and combination effects need to be taken into account in a better way. And of course, we will never be able to say that we know everything. We will always be likely to overlook something. But still, we need this. We need to be aware that in parallel, we have to take other measures as well. So we need regulations for non chemical uh, pesticides, they need to um, have the precedent or they need to be uh, used um, primarily at the application of synthetic or chemical um, products should be the means of last resort and they should not only exist on paper. I would like to s finish with a little outlook. And this is a slide of a colleague of mine. And many of us do think that pesticide reduction is doing without something. But I would like to say what value added we get. So since the neonicotinoids can no longer be used, it's a little bit blurred, but you can see that there are clouds of small insects around the flowers. These are beneficial insects, and they paralyze pests, so certain Pests like a rapeseed beetle, which was a problem in the past, um, can now be dealt with by beneficial insects. And this could not be done in the past because the neonicotinoids do not only have an impact on pests but also on beneficial insects. So this is just one example of many that there is a possibility that a strong pesticide reduction does not mean doing without something does not bring about obstacles or whatever. It opens up new doors, and we need a respective policy for it and a respective preparedness. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Susan, für diesen sehr umfangreichen Überblick, der, glaube ich, noch mal sehr deutlich gemacht hat, warum. Thank you very much, Susan, for this overview, which has made quite clear why we need a new regulation. And I will definitely come back to the glyphosate phase out later on. And maybe we can also take along the question, what does it mean, what you just said, for the national pesticide reduction strategy. But first of all, I would like to give the floor to Carsten. And very briefly, a question to the technical side. Can we get the monitors running again? Oh, OK, so obviously they're broken. So Carsten, you can now give us an overview over the study that has been published, Gone is Gone. Together with Klaus Henning Groth, you published this study and are the author of it. And we also um, have shown it uh, here at the Bell Foundation. So maybe you can explain the connection between the loss of biodiversity, the biodiversity crisis, and pesticides in particular. And I'm looking forward to what you're going to say. Many thanks for the invitation. Many thanks to Martin for the uh, trust that we were able to uh, draw up this study. And I would like to thank to Klaus Henning Roth. He must be in the room here somewhere. And it was really a great collaboration that uh, we have set up there. And uh, last but not least, uh, thanks uh, to the great overview and the very important uh, impulse and drive that uh, Dr. Andrea Best uh, gave us who accompanied the process. Uh, when I was asked uh, to be part of the study, or if I could imagine to be part of the study or these studies, a collection of studies, I was thinking, well, another study. It's something that you can do, but uh, once uh, I had the possibility to come to a meeting, a municipal meeting, a few weeks after, and somebody from a Christian party said that uh, he saw a lot of uh, insects uh, flying around in his garden and would be a lot uh, more dramatic than it is actually is. And I think we need a lot more studies because it has not yet reached uh, the minds of people. 
and uh, since I had the possibility to look into it for many weeks uh, with Klaus Henning, there are so many studies you cannot read them from beginning to end because it really makes you upset. But um, I figured out that it's very important uh, to draw the attention to it. One who has already traveled on the ship and uh, you would imagine that somebody would hammer out 50 bolts uh, every day. You can keep on working on the ship, but it will not turn out uh, to have a a happy ending. I mean, um, it is everything that we know that uh, is going against the wall. So um, in a few minutes, I would like to uh, run through the results uh, of uh, the study. The study is available. It is a collection of different studies, and science is quite clear about it. Just a few remarks. Uh, Professor Zendler, Professor Jeniger, Professor Fadman, Professor Ebisch, Professor Suko, all those gentlemen who have really dig deep into the issue have come to the conclusion that we do have a huge problem in front of us. If uh, we uh, um, draw it up in uh, the graph of uh, the planetary boundaries, then biodiversity is uh, displayed uh, a lot better than it is actually um, on the ground and something that we have accepted more or less, which is the climate crisis. And uh, the uh, coming together of those two crises, the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis, is something that uh, we can really um, compared to this ship I was uh, talking about before that is losing 50 bolts every day. And um, it should be the red button if I'm right. There we are. So I have come up with a short overview of the different studies that uh, have been published in the past. Uh, the uh, this in report um, is just one of them. And uh, the closer we look, and now we um, Look a bit closer to the soil because I'm a soil scientist and I'm really happy to see the soil atlas being published here from the Heinrich Boll Foundation because this shows that uh, we really did not look uh, very closely when it comes uh, to the situation of our soils. And uh, I was uh, working for the biological service in North Rhine Westphalia and then we see on a daily basis what happens on our surfaces. And we do have many soils that are already quite degraded and we want to compensate say they were quite open to the use of different technologies, but the problem that the resources, the raw materials that we cannot do without and uh, the uh, co cooperation of the different uh, microorganisms in the soil that uh, we have abandoned them and neglected them is something that uh, remains to be seen uh, in terms of consequences. And um, I do allow myself to speak uh, to the agriculture and I've learned that we're not uh, really talking about the agriculture in general or the farmers, we have to diversify this um, speech. Um, I uh, used to work on a farm that uh, became an organic farm, and I learned a lot uh, during this transition when talking to the neighbors and other farmers in the village. Uh, I did uh, become more aware of uh, those different constraints and restrictions they find themselves under, and um, I would like to talk briefly about uh, what consequences it might have if we keep on doing what we did in the last uh, decades. This is a picture from North Rhine Westphalia. Our different um, federal states are responsible for natural protection, and they draw up a balance every once and then. I used that picture for a different presentation, so sorry for that. But this is something that has been provided by the ministry in Dusseldorf, by the ministry of the federal state of North Rhine-Westphalia, I think, back in 2021. Uh, we were saying that... Uh, or drawing a balance on how biodiversity is looking like. And we can embellish it, but uh, once um, and for all, we have to say that we find ourselves in a dramatic situation. And um, those uh, species that are especially uh, vulnerable for pesticides, um, the amphibia, for example, are um, one of them. And uh, the trend is quite clear. And uh, we are losing many different species every day, every year. Um, this is a book on insects that has been published uh, two years ago. Insects are dying out in the middle of Europe. And uh, this is a quite thorough report on um, 
how species are getting lost uh, currently, what the pressure are they find themselves under, and uh, talking about the root causes, and of course agriculture and the land use and uh, the sealing of our surfaces, uh, the uh, drying out of uh, our moors is uh, just one of those examples, and um, then of course um, one uh, of those uh, reasons is the agriculture and uh, the use of different pesticides whose uh, consequences we um, cannot even assess. Then we have this risk assessment we were talking about. And then just uh, briefly, there was a study that is repeated uh, every few years in Northern Westphalia where we see how urine is uh, a burden in kindergartens, and I've read that only 9% of those samples uh, had uh, were contaminated with glyphosate that are under the uh, assessment threshold, um, and uh, the word only 9% was quite alarming. So one out of 10 children is well, absorbing glyphosate, uh, we can talk about uh, the different uh, concentrations, which, um, according to the scientific, is below the threshold. But still, this is something that uh, those children take up with their food and is then um, leaving the body with the pee. And I think this is alarming enough uh, when we talk about uh, those issues. We have had enough discussions in Brussels, but let's now come back to our objectives. Uh, I think we're all aware that uh, the COP15 took place in Montreal. It should have taken place in Kuming. This is why it's called uh, the Kuming montreal Agreement. And um, this is where we, from the viewpoint of uh, natural protection, uh, there are a few successes that uh, we can show, but we have to get into action more rapidly and more effectively. Here on the fourth, uh, reduce risk from pesticides by at least 50% by 2030. This is one of the objectives. So the goal to uh, cut pesticides by half by 2030, then we have to differentiate. There are a few pesticides that are um, more toxic, those highly hazardous pesticides, and uh, those new substances um, might be more specific, but still more hazardous, and this cannot be the solution. So there are uh, different uh, solutions or different uh, uh, commitments, and uh, Germany is committed, but uh, when it comes into the implementation, then the picture is quite different. So we have uh, conducted uh, studies on birds, on insects, and they all come to the same conclusion. There is a need for action here. From the pesticide atlas, you can see what the amounts are that uh, on pesticides that are sprayed on our fields, and this is um, once again quite alarming. And we can look at this graph for quite some time. The many different aspects um, that are highlighted here to the right side, so you see the different substances that are used in um, terms of examples. And this is a cocktail that uh, does not do us any good, not to us as humans, not to our waters, and not to the species. Uh, we need urgent action. And a year ago, a study has been drawn up uh, where those different aspects have been listed that um, studies that are done, 800 studies uh, are evaluated, analyzed, and we come to the conclusion, why, why does, why do the policymakers don't do anything? Why are they still able to uh, ban glyphosate? Because we don't really know up to the last bit if it's really um, a carcinogenic substance. And so I really have to change our minds, I really have to come into the acting part. So um, it's not very easily to read, uh, but uh, this uh, is what we've come up uh, with, with Martin Heusling in our study. So uh, concluding, I want to say that we have to act more rapidly because um, if we don't, in 10 years, uh, we come back together here talking about the same studies and uh, the IPAP uh, goal to stop uh, the loss of biodiversity by 2020, something that we have to admit that we were not able to do that. And uh, we need uh, more ambitious 
goals um, and um, really implement them. So this was very, a very quick overview and really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Carsten, for that uh, summary. And thank you for the appeal, for uh, the call upon all of us. Um, and uh, pesticide burden in children is something that Larissa might talk about later. And uh, now I would like to ask Silke to the uh, podium. And we now have a double contribution from Kenya. Silke was uh, an author of uh, a report that was published last September for the use of uh, highly hazardous pesticides in Kenya, published by the um, Kenya Office uh, of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. She will just shortly present uh, the results of the study and we'll talk about the role of German producers and manufacturers. And then we have a video statement of uh, our colleague Haroon from the office in Kenya. So, Silke, over to you to start with. Well, yes, I will try to be quite quick, as quick as uh, Carsten. We only have a few slides here to go through. Don't worry. But before we come to the results, I would like to briefly uh, give you an overview on the situation of Kenya. The import of pesticides is significantly in rising. To the left side on the graph, we can see that within just four years, from 2015 to 2018, the import of pesticides has been triplicated. And uh, to the right-hand side, you see a map from the pesticide atlas that shows that um, although pesticide use is quite low in Kenya when compared to other countries, and now in the crisis, crises we find ourselves in, um, the argument uh, that uh, only by increasing production we can get out of these crises and of course we need more pesticides and uh, more um, um, plant protection substances and Kenya is just an example but this can of course uh, be extrapolated to other countries. We have conducted a similar study in Nigeria and South Africa is another country and they show exactly the same results. Yeah, and but uh, in the end, it's really, really difficult uh, to find out uh, the volume of pesticides that are used, uh, what kind of crops, what kind of fields, what kind of uh, multinationals uh, sell those pesticides, because this is not data that is available for the public. So this is really difficult uh, to obtain this data. Usually we have uh, import data from the FAO, and uh, for this study we have uh, used real use data, so pesticides that have been used in uh, 2022, and were able to um, make uh, a meaningful expression of what we've seen. And uh, it was quite surprising and shocking at the same time because it showed that 44% of those pesticides used in Kenya are basically banned in the EU because uh, they pose too high risk uh, for the health of uh, humans and other beings and uh, for the environment. Uh, still, 44% of uh, those pesticides are pesticides that are banned in the EU. Uh, Carbosulfam, betacifiltrine, imidacloprid, tocloprifos, all those, uh, to just name a few of those insecticides, imidacloprid was uh, named uh, by um, Carsten, oh, no, by um, Susanna Inio. Nicotinoid and uh, chlorpyrifos is um, um, a toxic to the uh, nerves and paraquat and glyphosate are, uh, of course, uh, others that are highly dangerous that are not bent in EU and fungicides like mancozeb and carbendazamine. And uh, those uh, are um, apply to 40% of the agricultural surface. And then we might say farmers in Kenya don't really use that many pesticides, but 40% of the overall arable land or the overall agricultural land is quite an amount. And then on top of that, we have to say that users usually do not really know all the consequences and uh, the uh, dimension of uh, the health hazards. So very few can uh, allow to buy uh, personal protective equipment and in different climatic uh, conditions. It's not even bearable to wear the PPA and uh, what's simply too important. Uh, this is something that uh, has been drawn up uh, by um, 
the uh, Association of Farmers uh, that uh, came up with the data that only 15% of farmers are really aware protective equipment. What we found quite interesting is that uh, 76% of those pesticides are part of uh, the uh, um, highly hazardous pesticides according to the PEN criteria. And uh, only 2%, uh, there's a seven um, of, out of uh, 131 uh, products are biopesticides uh, or organic pesticides. So this is quite worrying if only 7% might be only a little bit less hazardous. So what the future will be looking like is the question. And um, then uh, they are simply too expensive. And uh, what we were able to drop by uh, the... Um, the studies that um, they're simply not available and they're much more expensive. Uh, so Marshall has uh, um, marketed carbon sulfan that is $23 per hectare, uh, Cliperifus is 13 and Achuk, which is a neem extract, which is an organic pesticide, uh, well, costs $86 per hectare. And this, of course, lowers acceptance. And up to the right, you can see that uh, farmers uh, basically spend uh, the biggest amount of the money on glyphosate, 4.2 million, and clopoversos, 3.2 million dollars. So this is a lot of money that could be invested elsewhere. Here just shortly what uh, our different crops are, where pesticides are used on, and uh, the graph in the middle, the big one with the different bars, so uh, show the different crops. Uh, red are the highly hazardous pesticides that are used on those crops, and in gray, the not uh, uh, highly hazardous uh, crops. And you can see the majority is red in maize and wheat, coffee, potatoes, tomatoes, and uh, maize and tomatoes are basically those uh, the staple food that is used in Kenya the most. Um, and uh, now I've taken out a different graph here down below on the left-hand side. Sorry, I have to turn around. And you can see that 79% of those pesticides used in the country are banned in the EU that are used for tomato production. Seven million dollars are spent a year on tomato crops. And uh, what we found out in a study two years earlier is uh, that uh, 18 different highly hazardous pesticides are used on tomatoes. So I'm almost done with my slides. Um, now the question is, where do those pesticides come from? This is data that we were able to obtain. And uh, what uh, we observed is that German producers have quite a huge market share. We usually state that uh, the majority of pesticides come from China and from India, but data has shown quite uh, significantly that Bayern Bersef have the second largest market share uh, with a 17.4% in Kenya with a turnover of $12.8 million. So they are those who sell the majority of pesticides. Um, and. Uh, they're applying double standards. Um, this is uh, what is shown in the next two sentences. So Bayer sells 15 products with substances that are banned in Europe. This is 40% of uh, the uh, turnover they're making in Kenya. And uh, those products uh, that are best sellers is, are Thunder, the insecticide which is the substance better cyflatine. This is a 1B substance. And Bayer and BSF have committed themselves uh, in 216 already to not sell 1B substances anymore. So they still do that. And uh, 1A and 1B is highly toxic or highly hazardous, according to the WHO. And this is why they're not supposed to be sold anymore. And uh, like the Rotterdam Convention is one of uh, those regulations um, that are banning those substances. But still, it's one of the best sellers for buyer in Kenya. On top of that, uh, this product contains imidacloprid. Uh, we know that this is toxic for bees. And the other best sellers round up Turbo, which is glyphosate um, or contains glyphosate. In BASF, it's not any better. They are selling 10 products. So they have a lower market share, but still they sell 10 products with substances banned in Europe. And this makes up the 75% of the overall turnover. And uh, one of them is Basta, with the substance glyphosate ammonium and Seriaxa with epoxyconazole. 
Yeah, um, so viel zu der zu den so, that much uh, to the results of the study. A lot has changed in Kenya, and Tarun will talk about it um, from the Kenya office. But a movement has uh, been pushed um, to the streets. They do not want to accept the double standards, and they make their voices heard. And this is one of the reasons why Pan, Miseria, and Inkota have um, the, the petition that has been issued three years ago where we want to have an export ban for all those uh, pesticides banned in Europe. We have taken up this petition once again because uh, not a lot seem to have changed in Germany. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Silke. Well, this petition for the export ban of German pesticides has been mentioned. The study, I think, is not outside, but it's available online on the office of Kenya. And now we need the video statement from Harun Baroui. He is the program director for the right to food and uh, um, agriculture ecology working in the office uh, for the Irish Bird Foundation in Kenya is talking about the consequence of fairly hazardous pesticides and uh, the briefly mentioned movement, uh, which is a follow-up of uh, the study in Kenya, regulation of highly hazardous substances. I am uh, Harun Ori from the Hamish Paul Foundation uh, Nairobi office, and would like to contextualize the use of highly hazardous species in Kenya, basing my talk on an empirical study that was carried in 2020. To start with, I would like to address this issue by phrasing out the extent and impact of the use of highly hazardous species in this country. The extent to which the highly, highly hazardous pesticides are used in this country is quite extensive, and it involves uh, 310 products with 151 active ingredients applied across 26 different crops. The total amount of pesticide products applied is 3,068 tons, and, as, and a significant 76% of these are classified as highly hazardous pesticides. Colleagues, disturbingly, 44% of these pesticides are banned in the EU due to unacceptable risks. This heavy reliance on HHPs for insects, diseases, and weed control poses severe risks to both human health and our environment. Notably, the pesticide residues, especially in tomatoes and kales, are found in alarming levels, raising serious food safety concerns. This situation highlights the urgent need for regulatory action to mitigate the detrimental effects of public health, the environment, and overall food security. I would like also to address uh, also a paramount issue on uh, who is mostly affected by the use of highly hazard, uh, high hazardous pesticides in Kenya. The most affected groups by use of the HHPs in Kenya are the smallholders, the rural communities, and the marginal groups, groups that include women and youth. These vulnerable groups face acute and chronic health impacts due to pesticide exposure. A retrospective study at Kenyatta Hospital, which is actually our national referral hospital, revealed that pesticide poisoning accounting for 43% of cases was the most common type of poisoning. I think that's a point to note. And the smallholders farmers who constitute a significant portion of the population, they lack knowledge, resources, and access to protective equipment, making it a challenging issue 
to implement proper risk mitigation measures. This is compounded by the fact that the financial burden of purchasing pesticides further limits access to essential resources, perpetuating the cycles of poverty and hindering sustainable agriculture. So in other words, these are expensive inputs that affect the farming community in terms of raising their cost of production. And yes, they keep on depending on these inputs with a mental orientation that they are going to realize increased yields in quotes. Allow me to conclude, but this not being the least issue, on the political success with regard to pesticide regulation that we have achieved in Kenya in the recent past. Just last year, the government of Kenya announced a phase out of seven active ingredients that include uh, crolodalonine and also crolopyrifos by December 31 this year. That's the 31st of December 2024. And this is a step in the right uh, direction that as a foundation we acknowledge and, and uh, really are proud of the government for taking that step. However, there are still challenges that need to be addressed. This including the, or include the lack of publicly available and systemized national pesticide data and the insufficient comprehensiveness of the monitoring and surveillance schemes. These gaps highlight that while initial steps have been taken, more substantial practical success are needed, such as establishing a robust regulatory mechanism, enhancing data transparency, and ensuring stringent and effective uh, stringent enforcement to effectively address the widespread use of the highly hazardous pesticides in Kenya. Thank you. Ja, vielen Dank an Harun für diese Thank you very much to Harun for these, uh, at least in part, encouraging words. As he said, seven active ingredients were put on a banning list in Kenya, so they will be taken off the market. This is a step into the right direction. I would like to pass the floor to Larissa Bombardi. She has just published a new book, Agriculture, Chemicals, and the so-called chemical colonialism, I was lucky to get the book through my colleagues in Brazil who have supported the publication and be able to read it um, up front. And Larissa will now tell us what this term chemical colonialism means and how the utilization of pesticides in Brazil has some connections with colonialism and the capitalist agricultural system and how the relation between the use of pesticides in Brazil is connected to the European Union. Larissa, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, so what is chemical colonialism? Why, I, why am I uh, uh, talking about chemical colonialism? Uh, so this is the cover of my book that Lena has already shown to you. Um, and here, to begin with, I would like to show this map. It's about uh, pesticides exportation. As, as you can see, the European Union is controlling about one third of the uh, world pesticides exportation. But when we look at where uh, those pesticides are going, they are mainly going to the global south. Uh, of course, in, in Africa, it's grown up. But uh, so far, the Latin America is the uh, most important market for these products. And however, as you know, as it was already said this morning, the European Union has the most restrictive law uh, to pesticides. Uh, as you can see, 
you have already banned about uh, 269 uh, pesticide substance. And uh, Brazil, for example, or the rest of the world uh, haven't, uh, they, they didn't uh, uh, ban neither third substance. And Brazil is one of the main markets for these banned pesticides. Uh, in the European Union, I know that it's a matter of concern here, but when we are looking at the situation in Brazil and we think about these uh, charts, when we can see that the European Union uh, is, is selling about 5% less pesticides than 10 years ago, and we look at this, in Brazil, the, the total sales increased about 78% in the same period. So these companies are, not, uh, are no longer uh, selling the, the amount that they are selling before, but they are, uh, these substances, are, the, the market is growing up year after year, and they are going somewhere. They are going to the global south. Uh, this is one of the main reasons that I'm calling this process as chemical colonialism. This is one of them, this double standard, I mean. This is one of them. There are three main reasons uh, that I am calling this chemical colonialism. And here, another example of this double standard, because we, here we have the top 10 uh, pesticides sold in Brazil, and uh, out of 10, five are banned in the European Union. And Brazil is the main uh, consumer of pesticides. So for this, you can have an idea about what's going on. Uh, this is the case of atrazine, for example, one of the banned pesticides sold in, uh, in Brazil, banned here. And uh, it's related to many, many uh, health problems. Uh, serious problem. We are talking about cancer, for example, or infertility, or um, endocrine uh, disruption, and so on. And here we have another kind uh, of uh, uh, double standards. When we are talking about residues, here we have the example of carbaryl, which is toxic to mammals, and it's an endocrine disruptor. We, in Brazil and Argentina, for example, we allow 200 times residues of this substance banned here than the amount allowed in the European Union. Uh, this is the case of chlorotholonil, which is fungicide, endocrine disruptor as well, and etc. I could give you more than 100 examples like this, shocking examples, because there are places in, in Brazil uh, when children are developing early puberty, and when we are talking about early puberty, we are talking about two years old girls that have already developed their breast and hair pub, just to give you an idea about what's going on. What is chemical colonialism? And here another example, Iprodione, which is a fungicide, and here chloratolonil again, 600 times uh, higher residue in lettuce in Brazil, for example, than here. And finally, the, for me, this is the most uh, impressive example, but because we are talking about glyphosate with all of uh, its impact. And in the drinking water, we are allowing 5,000 more residues than you. So it's a, a problem that the problem is really spread in the country. It's affecting our biodiversity uh, since the, uh, the microorganism until us. Uh, this is the case of atrazine. Just to give you an example, just to talk about Amazon, just to think about the biodiversity, the uh, the atrazine, the, the sales of atrazine has increased uh, more than more than 500 percent in the the latest 10 years. In the Brazilian Amazon is the main area 
where the pesticides are growing up in the country. So, and what, uh, what's going on when we are talking about people? Uh, the number of people poisoned in the country increased more than 100% in the latest years. And the, may, uh, the main affected are children and even babies, babies uh, with less than one year old, they have been poisoned. Here we have uh, uh, 500 babies poisoned, which uh, could mean more than 2,000 babies poisoned because the unreported cases are really high. And uh, also pregnant women and so on, which means that the future generations are also impacted even, the babies are impacted even before they were born. And here, if we, if we are talking about the, who are, who, what is the ethnicity most affected, we uh, find that the indigenous people are the most affected. And here I have the third uh, aspect when we are talking about uh, uh, chemical colonialism, because the classical colonialism on the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, we are talk when we are talking about this classical, this historical colonialism, we are talking about the the, viol the physical violence, the evictions, the expulsions, the murders, etc. But they were physical violence, and now we are facing this chemical violence in the land conflicts. I think it's important to highlight that we are talking about land conflicts, the conflicts between the indigenous people or the peasant communities against uh, these uh, areas with monoculture. The lands of lords, the, the big farmers, are pressuring those communities to leave their areas, and one of the weapons are pesticides. And here another example, in this case in a state called Mato Grosso do Sul, you can see in the first plan the, the soybean crops, and in the back the indigenous area. And here one case, the, in this case this, this, this child was also poisoned in the substance used in this conflict was this one, this fungicide, ironically called nativo, like native, from Bayer. This, this pesticide is, is sold by Bayer in Brazil. And here, uh, to finish uh, this map about aerial spray in Brazil, used as weapons in land conflicts. So that's why I am allowed to talk about chemical colonialism. And I do believe that we need to, to build an international framework on pesticides, which must aim not just to reduce uh, their use, but uh, in I don't know in how many times we need to discuss this, but we need to phase out this substance because we are not talking about face hunger. The hunger is increasing in the world. We are talking about uh, business. So thank you so much for your attention. Herzlichen Dank, Larissa. Ich glaube, diese Thank you very much, Larissa. I think these figures and facts are quite impressive for everyone in a negative sense, of course. Um, and I think it makes clear that these double standards between the pesticides that are banned or not allowed in the EU and are being applied uh, in Brazil, for example, that it also comes down to the regulation on the ground, also when it comes to the residue thresholds. So uh, thank you very much for that. So we will have another brief round with questions that I will ask you. And then I would like to open up the discussion for um, contributions from the audience. I would like to start with you, Martin. I think we have heard enough evidence why a stricter evidence regulation is needed. Um, 
and you have briefly um, talked about that, but can you elaborate on the obstacles? Why do we not have a stricter regulation, either in terms of the double standards, but also the restrictions within the EU? Well, I, in my uh, operation, I've been working without any pesticides for 35 years already, so I don't even know the uh, names uh, in part anymore. But it becomes quite clear every um, ecological farming operation shows that it is possible. But of course, in America, there's not only Copa Cocheca, a farmers association which is benefiting from it or participating, a uh, difficult word, uh, or benefiting from it. So let's put it like that. So they, uh, when a hook says that he's a leader of the farmers and he's also in the supervisory board of Bayer, for example, so there's this close connection of the pesticide industry and the farmers association and they uh, have similar arguments in Brussels. The funny thing about it is that they argue, well, we have to feed the world. But what is happening in Brazil with soy, for example, I mean, this is not serving the global population and um, this is basically a foodstuff for uh, animals in um, feedstuff for animals in, in Europe for chicken or whatever. So this has nothing to do with uh, feeding the world. But the argument that came up time and again after the beginning of the Ukraine war, so for example, yesterday in a speech uh, at an opening of the IGV, we heard it again. So we have to feed the world, um, the International Green Week, sorry. So we have to feed the world. This is what we could hear there again. But this is not correct. So of course we can do without many things. But the fact that the industry is bringing up arguments which can no longer be held up because they're simply not true. And that we also see that these arguments reach the parliaments is really frightening to a certain extent. At the beginning, it was said, well, um, it has been approved by the EU, so it should be safe. But I can only say the EU has approved many things. Um, all the substances that are now banned were actually approved in the past. And after 20 years, for example, they found out, oh, it was more toxic than initially thought. So neonicotinoid, for example, it's not that old of a problem or, or issue. But up until the end, up until the ban, it was said, well, the detrimental effect is not that bad. So um, to simply refer to the approval of the EU is not enough. And we can see it with glyphosate as well. Yes, exactly. Glyphosate is the best example for it. I mean, we've long debated it and had long discussions. And then there's the EFSA. Um, and they said, well, we have reviewed thousands of studies which said everything is great. But you have to know where the studies are coming from. The EFSA has never conducted their own studies. These are only industrial studies, uh, studies conducted by the industry uh, and paid for by the industry. And of course, they are not uh, giving you a study saying that glyphosate is bad. So, And the EFSA had to um, agree to that in the whole process of the debate. But still, there are some loopholes. So. For example, the effect on the soils, the effects on the waters. This is not clear, but the EFSA still in the end said, well, if you take the larger picture, it's not really detrimental. And how many people died of it? No one. So, but I mean, you always have to provide 100% proof that something is dangerous in order to get it banned. And this is really the huge lack in the European legislation. We have a precautionary principle, basically. I do not have to prove that children die or people die of it. I just have to say that there's a risk, and this risk needs to lead to actions. We have to act. And what is now being done is even more strange. In order to do without pesticides, it is being said, we need genetic engineering so and a genetic modification. But genetically modified plants are not leading to less pesticides, but more pesticide utilization. So. I mean, this is strange that we hear this argument from different sides. So this is really a campaign um, which is blurring the actual picture or trying to blur the actual picture. We're trying to counter that in Brussels, but um, especially when I look at glyphosate, I mean, who had access to the commission? I mean, it's not the NGOs. It's the representatives of the industry who, first of all, get access to the commission before the commission starts to act. And they all talk to the Commission. And it already has been mentioned earlier, why is it so difficult to ban the exports of the pesticides? 
And we've seen it in the example of Kenya, and of course, uh, the same holds true for other countries. This is the future market. Also, people from Bayer say it. In Europe, we will see a decline in the sales, but we have future markets, Latin America, Asia, and Africa, and they invest there. So Europe, from their point of view, they, they know that they cannot increase their market share or increase their market as such. And this is the problem that we are faced with in Brussels. It's a giant lobby. I do not like to talk about lobbyists because they have a function as well. But in this regard, there is a huge imbalance between lobbyists from the chemical industry and uh, NGOs. And this has led to the fact that the ZUA process, I think you said it, that we actually do have a regulation which is exactly the same as the ZUA. But the current regulation is a voluntary regulation, um, and it does not have any effect. And even Germany did not put clear data on the table. So this is why we need a binding regulation, a clear target. And if Europe cannot do it, we cannot go to other countries and tell them, well, you should reduce your pesticide utilization and application. And well, um, bioecologic agriculture um, is not rocket science. Um, so, of course, nobody is checking the farmers, what they do. Every farmer in Europe can do whatever he or she wants in terms of the pesticide application, and they can determine whether they see or consider them useful or not. And um, there's also a huge gray area when it comes to the application, because every farmer can buy these pesticides anywhere, and in how far they apply them, and to what extent. I mean, there's hardly any control. Many thanks, uh, Martin, for the assessment, uh, summarizing uh, the lobby of the pesticides and the farmers is the biggest problem, their collaboration. And I remember that uh, we presented uh, the soil atlas here on Monday. And uh, the farmer said, we need glyphosate as a tool for soil protection because only then uh, fructose can be broken down. So this is um, quite something that is deep, deep, deep rooted in their minds and has to be changed. Susan, I would like to ask you, I think two days ago, we have um, issued uh, a uh, legal assessment by Ida Westphal that shows that although we have a reapproval of uh, glyphosate in the EU, the German government would indeed be able to do something. There are legal possibilities uh, in order to ban glyphosate in Germany or at least um, restrict their use. And uh, PAN, the Pesticide Action Network, issued a statement. So how do you assess the situation? What are the possibilities for us or here in Germany for the government uh, to ban the use of glyphosate or to restrict its use? Thank you, Lena. I have to draw a bigger line. Glyphosate has been reapproved. We all know that. Uh, it has uh, caused a lot of stir, a lot of discussion, um, impact on biodiversity and uh, carcinogenic effects. Um, and it has been repeated once again. Uh, well, now we have uh, the evidence that it's all good. And uh, why don't they keep still? And uh, the uh, the. And then uh, the uh, Cancer Society says, well, that, no, that it, it, it's just one of those voices. But uh, there is a sentence in the UAE that um, puts pressure on the APA to reassess glyphosate. We have INSERN. This is a French research institute uh, that um, um, is working for two ministries. And they are saying they do acknowledge that we do have this carcinogenic effect of glyphosate, but they are not uh, doing any any grading, any uh, categorization like 1A or 1B, like the classification that the ECHA is doing, the European Chemicals Agency, in order for the pesticide to be banned on the EU level. But from our viewpoint, the EU authorities have ignored 
certain assessments uh, and evidence and have uh, distorted uh, the results of uh, the cancer society. And this is why they have come to the conclusion that uh, glyphosate is not carcinogenic. And I wanted uh, this to be clear. There's huge evidence on the impact of glyphosate on the microbioma. There are quite alarming studies um, by um, um, general practitioners uh, or pediatricians uh, having looked into the uh, health status of uh, children. It has an impact on pollinators. It has an impact on the soil. And then uh, Pat, with the effect that uh, glyphosate still remains uh, to be one of the mostly used herbicides uh, that is, um, of course, a huge problem. So glyphosate has been reapproved, but uh, who's had the possibility to look into uh, the uh, uh, regulation of the EU, it is quite interesting. We have a table. Uh, there is a huge list uh, where the different member states are uh, told to, to take into consideration when they carry out an overall assessment. It's about the exposition of the users or the consumers, uh, the protection of small mammals, um, the impact of biodiversity, and so on. So the EU knows very well that uh, this substance will pose risks. And now they try to shift responsibility over to the member states. And uh, we think this is totally against harmonization that we would like to see. We want uh, no, we, we don't want to see member states playing against one another or different companies uh, competing against one another. And all the different member states have the possibility. Although we do have an approval of a substance on EU level, every single member state has the possibility to look into and assess the situation on their national level. Level. And then um, the approved regulation and the implementation regulation uh, provides the possibility. If the regional situation is different or in case of uh, having specific conditions on the ground, so they do have the possibility to ban certain products, to restrict their use, or to impose um, um, certain conditions on the use. And this is what the expert opinion said. Like, the member states cannot do that. Luxembourg has failed. Why did they fail? Because uh, they um, try to, to argument uh, with a political reason. So this is not possible. It has to be a scientific justification. And we don't really like scientific evidence. So and I think um, Germany now is in the possibility and in the responsibility to, um, um, uh, to act out in due diligence. Thank you, Susan. Luxembourg is one of the examples. Another one is Austria. Carsten, could you briefly talk about glyphosate from the perspective of uh, the protection of biodiversity? We have talked briefly about uh, the soils. How about biodiversity? Well, glyphosate is only one of um, many, many substances, many, many products. And in the end, uh, we won't really find many farmers who have studied chemistry. There might be a few, but uh, I don't think they are all too conscious about it. So before we uh, um, spray those substances, uh, then uh, we have to know what is already there. What is the cocktail that we find on the fields and in the uh, waterways? Um, so um, the flooding that we've seen now has gotten better, and uh, the farmers that are on the streets will go back to the fields. And if uh, the soils or the fields have dried sufficiently in order to not uh, have an impact when a glyphosate is applied uh, on our waterways, then this is something that farmers have to think about. Of course, uh, there are counseling, there are different um, trainings that are offered. Uh, so we have uh, certain conditions that have to be fulfilled. Um, but uh, I think there are a few farmers that simply get their substances from the internet. And so this is a huge problem that uh, we don't really know in detail what uh, the different um, 
um, um, the, um, co um, the cooperation or the working together with glyphosate and other substances in the soil, what impact they have. And soils are highly complex. Uh, so when uh, you uh, drill down the soil five meters, it looks completely different. So we don't have an identical soil whatsoever. So it is uh, really so different when it comes to climate, when it comes to different regions, um, the pool size. Um, Last year, the soil of the year was uh, the arable land, and uh, I have participated in one of those uh, meetings and conferences, talking to different farmers, and there are a few farmers that have acknowledged the problem already. But um, now they find themselves in this difficult situation that they have to produce certain yields. and. Um, but um, since it is possible to do things differently, every single farmer has the choice to do it differently. And younger farmers, I think, are a lot more aware. They use different possibilities. They try to change crops more frequently. So if you follow maize by maize and you don't come up with anything else, so you follow up with maize once again, then of course you won't do anything good to the soil. And um, even without life, I said, we do have our problems and um, so resistances. This is another issue. This is quite shocking when we think about um, all those plants showing resistances against those uh, highly active substances. What does it do to the soil with well, our organisms? And I'm part of a research team for more than 20 years. I'm not even analyzing the results, but we are collecting data. And um, we were looking into mammals. This institute is close uh, to the Veterinarian University in Hanover, and they have found uh, several dead animals, dead, dead mammals, like seals or um um, or have purposes. And uh, in uh, our food chain, they're quite down below, but uh, the enrichment of the adipose tissue is a huge problem, even in bigger mammals. I'm not a veterinarian, so I don't really want to go too much into detail, but the colleagues have um, been quite explicit. How about um, the exposure of uh, bigger mammals? Can we find glyphosate in those animals? In the city? Well, yes, of course. So it, it is uh, quite alarming when we look into those uh, research uh, results. Um, we are one of those bigger animals as well. So the precautionary principle cannot be left aside. But this is something that we observe more and more. And then you were talking about GMO, genetically modified organisms. So it seems to be that we're saving the world with them. But it leads to the fact that farmers uh, um, getting like this new infusion like a patient in the hospital. And I think we have to think back uh, to the practice that we used to do in earlier generations. Um, of course, we can uh, breed uh, different breeds, but um, to manipulate with our genetic, uh, um, genetically modified organisms, I think it's very difficult to foresee what um, the final consequence will be. And um, artificial intelligence and everything that um, is coming into play, I think we will not be able to substitute everything with a 3D printer. So, Carsten, you were saying that it's important to have uh, frequent changes of crops uh, instead of using glyphosate all the time. And uh, let's now come to possible solutions. Let us, I would like to invite you to inform us a little bit more about uh, the agricultural movement in Brazil. On one hand, we have seen those alarming numbers um, that uh, Brazil really is a world champion in the use of pesticides. But at the same time, they are pioneers in agri um ecology. So we did have a huge congress in Brazil, I think with 10,000 uh, participants. Uh, so this is a huge success. And, um, and uh, yesterday we've heard from Bread for the World um, 
the Brazilian Food uh, Council was meeting in December with very precise, uh, concrete uh, um, ideas of how we can raise demand in those organic products. And I know you have brought along a few slides. Um, I would like to briefly close down the panel discussion, but then afterwards uh, we will have the possibility to share all the different presentations and the links to the studies. Larissa, over to you. What can we learn from Brazil agroecology without pesticides? sure if I well understood. Afterwards, I have the opportunity to show some pictures or just now? How is the, how is your proposal? Wir können alle Folien im Nachgang so all the slides can be shared afterwards. Um, okay. And now we will keep it a bit briefer, if that's okay. Good pictures to show you. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we, no, it could be afterwards, just to, to because after, I know from my own experience that when we see those slides, oh my, oh my God, what, what can we do? It's, it's tough. But we have in Brazil uh, something really important. I think I've, I have already said that we need to export this social technology. No, it's uh, apart for a joke. Uh, we have in Brazil an important social movement, which is called the MST, uh, which means Landless Rural Workers Movement. And they, uh, they are the main, for example, one of the examples, they are the main uh, organic rice organic producers. Uh, and they have been um, doing really good experiences toward the agroecology model. And I would say that women are the protagonizers of these experiences. Uh, they have been resisting to this model. They are facing this model in their daily lives. When we are talking about uh, the, the small uh, farmers, for example, the small the, the farmers, this, uh, when we are talking these settlements or the areas of quilombolas, quilombolas are peasants that have this, uh, they are, they, their origin uh, come, comes back to the, um, come back to the African slavery. So they resist in the land. They have uh, a lot of uh, uh, tools, I would say, a lot of uh, knowledge about how to deal with agriculture uh, and when I am talking about this, I am uh, talking about, uh, for example, a uh, place in Brazil called the Vale do Ribeira in São Paulo State, or in the Cerrado, Brazilian Cerrado, which is a Brazilian savanna, uh, or in the Amazon, or in, in all of our biomes, we have. Uh, these experiences, and in the last uh, Brazilian Agroecology Congress, as uh, Lina Red said, we had more than 5,000 people together in Rio de Janeiro uh, working and exchanging their experiences. It's, um, it's a huge movement in Brazil, and the women also say that without feminism, there's no agroecology. So it's a, it's a huge movement in Brazil. We have different uh, kinds of exchange between these settlements or these indigenous areas, etc., and the general, I would say, the general population. So it's increasing its importance. We have also our National Forum Against Pesticides, which puts together uh, members of uh, public ministry, scientists, and civil society. It's, an, it's, a, it's a really important uh, forum, and uh, we have this exchange, all of this exchange, everybody together. This uh, Congress was one of the examples about this exchange when we are not separate, you know? We are not uh, in, like in, in different worlds, worlds uh, like scientists and uh, Peasants, no, we are all together uh, building this uh, agroecology path. Thank you. 
Vielen Dank, Larissa. Many, many thanks. Um, yeah, this is uh, very something quite motivating. It's, uh, it's quite positive to hear. Silke, I know that uh, as an agrotoxicologist, uh, you have worked a lot uh, with the use of pesticides, but uh, you have worked a lot uh, and uh, looked into alternatives to pesticides uh, in Kenya, for example. Can you give us a few examples what works well? How do civil society and policymakers and science work together? Yeah, let's uh, take a last pol uh, positive stance. I think it's quite uh, good to finish on a positive note. And I think uh, this report has changed a lot in Kenya. I think we really have been able to change the mindset of people. So people are a lot more aware of uh, what impacts of pesticides are. So pesticides are sold in so-called chemistries that are like pharmacies. So we have the medical products on the left side and the pesticides on the right hand side. And I won't forget where we had a meeting with farmers standing up having uh, tears in their eyes saying that they didn't know how toxic it was and please tell us how we can do it differently. So those are very nice and uh, motivating moments. And now with this report and uh, the uh, awareness uh, rising, uh, we have a huge run on organic products uh, by the urban science, Nairobi first and foremost, but other um, cities as well. They do want to have organic products. And many farmers that did uh, produce uh, organically, they extend and new farmers uh, go into the transition. And this shows that it is indeed possible. And once you have the market, once there is a demand, things happen, things might change. And I think there is a great example to be mentioned that was initiated by the farmers, uh, supported by the civil society in one of the counties in Kenya. Counties are like federal states here in Germany where they said we want to have a policy on agroecology. There is no national strategy on it, not on agroecology and not on organic farming. But this county, this region, together with civil society and policymakers decided that we want to um, implement um, a policy on agroecology, and many other counties think to follow suit and to do the same. And this is a county that uh, did have a huge vegetable production, wheat and maize, and maize, as you can see, uh, is a crop where a lot of pesticides are used on. Back to your question, Lena. My, the experience that uh, I have made, it's very important to think it systemically. So. If uh, we want to do the transition, a transition from a conventional farm to organic farming or less pesticides, and it's not sufficient to say that we want to replace highly hazardous pesticides by organic pesticides. Many soils are degraded. We have very vulnerable plants that are super vulnerable for pests. So we have to think it systemically. It's not sufficient to replace one substance with the other. We have to reinvigorate uh, the soil with uh, soil management practices, uh, with different interim crops, um, um, uh, good water management. Of course, we have uh, a lot of soils that are simply dried down. And a very important concept um, that has gained ground uh, just uh, two years ago is seasonal farming. So Kenya has two rainy seasons, and maize was usually um, cultivated throughout the whole time. And now we have farmers saying, OK, we want to change. We want to have seasonal crops adjusted, adapted to the rainy season and to the climate. And I think this is a very important step forward. And it shows that uh, change is possible. So uh, there's so many farmers uh, that have switched to organic farming. What else is important? Uh, a lot of training centers have popped up, so farmers try to educate, try to train other farmers. This is not a concept that is supported by the government. We have the normal extension officers, so to say, that uh, are preaching conventional farming, so they have taken it up in their own hands, and they have an additional income once they offer those trainings. So I think they're very interesting movements uh, where we can learn a lot as well. Thank you very much for this positive 
out look, and I would like to open up the discussion for the audience. I think there's a mic that can go around, and we will first of all collect a few yeah, questions. I'm at, uh, Jan Pierke. So I can see someone over there, <coughs> the gentleman over there. Ich bin Jan Pecke von der Koalition gegen Ball gefahren. Ich habe eine Frage zu Brasilien. Und zwar ist es ja im Moment so, dass so ein Pestizidgesetz am Laufen law that is underway and it's quite old and it has passed, been passed by the Senate, by the Congress and it allows for huge deregulation in terms of pesticides, quicker approval processes and the risk assessment should be done by the not no longer by the health ministry, but the agricultural ministry, and Lula could have vetoed it, but he did not, uh, I mean, not an overall veto, he just vetoed it in part, and he said that the agricultural ministry should not do the risk assessment. So I wanted to ask you, how do you assess it, Larissa Bombardi? Is the how do you assess the pesticide policy of the Lula government? Thank you very much for the question. We will collect two more <laughs> questions. One in the back over there. Karin Ulich is my name. My question refers to the possibility to go to the courts. When people are so damaged in Brazil, in Africa, is there or are there any lawsuits against the industry? I mean, it would be possible, I guess. Are there any lawsuits? Thank you very much for your question. And there is a gentleman here in the first row. And then back there in the middle. Very briefly, here we only heard about the examples Brazil and Kenya, but the problem is extremely bad in the Central Asian states, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and in particular the cotton farms. They are massively uh, swamped in pesticides. So do you know in how far German companies are doing business there and what the impact is there? There, we do also see desertification, for example. Thank you. And now the last question for this round, the gentleman there in the middle. Yeah, thank you very much for this event. Frieden Falk is my name from the Brussels office of La Via Campesina. I've got two small questions. One to Ms. Bolmore. Uh, you mentioned the neem extract. Is this being imported or is it being produced regionally or where is it being produced? And the question to Mr. Heusring. We had the impression that the farm to fork strategy has actually died and also the promise of digital tools and technology that this would reduce pesticides. Do you share this view? And what kind of narratives could be brought up against it? Well, thank you very much. And we will have a second round soon. I know that more questions are waiting. One was the question to Larissa on the Brazilian pesticide policy. So uh, I'm not sure if I well understood your question. If not, you correct me, please. But yes, unfortunately, Lula has approved the poison package. Uh, with uh, some uh, some modifications, I would say that at least the name of the law, which is law of agrotoxins in Brazil, we have this name. It, it's a, it's a word created by a professor from my university, from the agriculture faculty, and uh, at least this name is preserved. Uh, and also, he balanced the the power. I would say, uh, in, in, among the, the ministries. But it's all, you know, because I think the, this poison package is a, a kind of, uh, it's a loss for all of us, you know, because, for example, the precautionary principle is that in our new law in this poison package, because there is a, they put, uh, an expression in this new law, which is that the substances that uh, bring an acceptable risk could be uh, prohibited, etc., etc. So, what is nobody knows what is an acceptable risk from any perspective? We know this, 
uh, neither from the, the, the law perspective or the uh, health uh, human perspective, what is this? In the end, uh, it's uh, this uh, simple expression allows everything, you know? So it's a loss. I believe that Lula's government is a divided, divided government. Uh, of course, there are some improvements, but it's the, I would say that the government, the Brazilian government is uh, hosted to agribusiness. This is my point of view. We have some improvements, of course. For example, if I'm talking about the Ministry of Agrarian uh, development, uh, which um, created the, uh, or recreated the, uh, a policy for uh, agroecology, etc., and also some agreements between the small farmers and hospitals uh, to to offer to deliver organic or agroecological food in the hospitals. It's which is really important, but it's. It's, it's still, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a divided uh, uh, government. Um, and yes, there are, in Brazil we have also some uh, laws in terms of uh, pesticides, of course. And f for example, one of these cases of the area we spring uh, over the indigenous land, this case went to the uh, our, to our Supreme Court, and the farmer, the big farmer, uh, were, was sued by the Brazilian government. So we have some cases, but uh, of course it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not the majority. Uh, yes, okay. Thank you. Um, genau, we have not these concrete Thank you very much. We also have the very concrete questions to Silke in terms of the neem pesticides and to Martin in terms of digitization. Well, let's start with that. And then there was also the question about Central Asia. Well, first of all, on the lawsuits, I know that Indian farmers are trying to sue the industry directly, but I'm not sure how this works out and what the outcome so far has been. But in Kenya, more and more human rights organizations are looking into this situation because currently there is a huge case of Del Monte. Del Monte is producing pineapple, and for pineapples, only one highly toxic pesticide is allowed. I'm not sure about the name of the pesticide, but um, there we had a case where this pesticide was uh, entered into the rivers and cows died and goats died and so human rights organizations are looking into it and there's a human right to a proper food and a clean environment that we can refer to and now on the brief question yes the neem extract is being produced in, within the country and it's basically also the bio side which is applied most often by the farmers. It is being produced by the local neem trees that grow there. Did you want to add something to the lawsuits? It looked like that? Yes, on the lawsuits. I mean, the difficulty usually is that the burden of proof is on the side of those who are affected, and this makes it so difficult. In the case of India, there were also OECD complaints. It was amongst others, I mean, there are several cases, but amongst others, it was uh, the polo product from Zengenta, where there was proof that it led to poisoning and also some deaths, several hundred poisoning cases, and there were police reports, so there were um, police um, investigations and documentations of those cases, so this was quite a good basis for it, but still, I think the ECCHR, I mean, they're also located here in Berlin. They provided support, but still, uh, and a lot of support was needed. Um, and very often the problem is that when a company is an international corporation, where can the local people go to? I mean, there's more and more attention, and I think in the future there will be more and more opportunities to take legal action. Uh, this was just one case, uh, which I just mentioned. But we do see that um, very often the poisoning cases, 
when it comes to environmental contamination, it's even more difficult. But when it comes to poisoning of human beings, which sometimes end in with the death of the person or are fatal, that they are difficult to document or are not documented at all. And to have a proof which is viable in front of a court, uh, to have something in writing from a hospital, for example, if they even got there, which says, OK, this and this active ingredient had led to this poisoning. And of course, then there's still the issue that the active ingredient could have been supplied by this or by that company. So it's very difficult. but. We know that the poisoning cases are underreported, so we would need. I mean, we know from peer review scientific proof that it's only the tip of the iceberg that is being reported. And last year, the huge chemicals conference took place in Germany, and pesticides were a topic there. And a new UN framework against this pollution of the world, which we also call third world crisis, and also the pollution of the environment by pesticides and also the pollution or the, the damaging of the health uh, is described there. And there is also mention of poison centers. I mean, if there are no centers or no doctors, people will not go there. And then we will not have a database. We will not have any documentation on these cases. And then, of course, the industry can always say, well, there's not much of a problem because there are not many cases. Or they can doubt the existing data. So this is the difficulty, um, which is very complex, um, the underlying complex basis of these uh, lawsuits. But I'm sure there will be more lawsuits in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for these very concrete examples. I mean, we all know the lawsuits uh, regarding glyphosate against Bayer Monsanto in the US. Do you also want to say something about the lawsuits? Well, only very briefly, because several years ago, I was in Bangladesh, and I saw there myself the small-scale farming structures. Uh, but pioneers in Genta, they are advertising a lot there, and they are uh, in big business there. And this, of course, confirms the statement that not only South America or Africa, but also the Asian region is, um, well, not blessed. I mean, we cannot put it like that, but affected by, by that. <coughs> well, I just wanted to briefly reply to your question. I'm not sure about the situation in Kyrgyzstan, but we have a more massive application of pesticides, insecticides in particular, with non-food products. So especially when you buy cotton products, you should always look for bio-cotton, because when it comes to the cotton cultivation, it's uh, one of um, those areas where most and um, pesticides are applied. Or for example, flowers from Kenya, we should not uh, buy them or eat them, or from Peru, for example, it's highly toxic. Um, I mean, there are no thresholds because people say, well, the flowers are not eaten, but the workers are affected in the cultivation of the plants. It's not always about food stuff, but to reply to your concrete question, can technology be a solution? Yes, this is the narrative, and uh, those people who are selling pesticides now create the narrative. There are many intelligent solutions, for example, the application of pesticides with drones or we reduce it through a better dosage because we can have a computer-driven uh, um, and very precise uh, application of pesticides. I mean, I do not want to say that this is not true, but it will not lead to a significant reduction. It will only improve the application. What we do need is a up turnaround um, of the system. We need to turn the system upside down, as banal as this might seem for ordinary farmers. We have to have crop rotation. We have to cultivate uh, varieties that everyone needs. When uh, we have spring, then of course there are the long lists what can be cultivated. And after that, there is the list which indicates, well, this plant is more prone to fungi, but please use um, the um, product of the same company that sells you the seed, which will allow you to fight fungi. Um, but this means, in many cases, you can only 
keep up your yields with lots of chemicals. I mean, we talk about GM crops and also a seed law in Europe, but we also need to get back to this huge variety of seed uh, seeds. Um, I mean, there are some varieties that need chemicals, but we should, well, use more of the others. And if you look at the companies, Bayer and Mon Monsanto, they, this is a chemical company, but they bought into this seed segment. And this is really a huge risk that we only have these highly specific varieties which can only um, survive by applying chemicals to them. And, of course, people might say, well, that's good because the um, farmer does not have to plow the ground and it saves um, uh, fossil fuels. Um, so I know a farmer who applies a lot of glyphosate before he cultivates, and then he cultivates the, the ground. And I ask him, why are you doing it? And he says, well, the soil needs to be clean. So there should not be any weed or whatever in the ground before he cultivates it. So this is the image today. So in the past, um, the farmland was uh, worked on in a conventional way, and we had um, weeds or other uh, plants. Um, but nowadays, you see nothing because we apply pesticides so intensively, not because it's necessary, but because there's the idea in the heads of the farmers that everything needs to be clean before they start with their cultivation. Of course, we could also accept a few weeds without any yield uh, cuts, but the industry has planted the idea in the farmers' heads. And I think the change will start in the minds of the people and not with more technology. It can be helpful, but it cannot be the only solution. Thank you very much, Martin. Well, uh, we started out five minutes late at the beginning, so I would like to uh, continue here now for another five minutes. Yeah. And uh, maybe here we have two questions, and then we'll have a second round of questions. Christian Rosenholt, I'm from the Association of Critical Investors, and we are waiting for the export ban of pesticides. It seems to be still in the ministries, and uh, one party that is quite yellow, he's referring to the Liberal Party, seems to be blocking negotiations. Do you have any more information on it? I'm a Shugowski from uh, the... Uh, we are in Congress, and uh, Mr. Häusling said that uh, the problem is in the industry agriculture, that pesticide is only a symptom. And of course, we can talk uh, long about uh, the system not changing in, uh, as a whole. So my question to you, where is your positive outlook or your perspective in order to get away from industrial agriculture and industrialization of agriculture? Easy question, easy to respond to. And then our third speaker. I have uh, worked with plant protection during 55 years, first by my education, then throughout my career. And I have to say, I'm happy that... Uh, we raised this issue. Could you get to your question directly, please? My question. It sounds as if the complexity is not really addressed. I have to say that uh, there is so many. Maybe we have too few people working in the practice. Uh, I have. Uh, been mixing together different uh, toxical substances back in the 60s. Uh, this is how I started out. Um, and um, I do have to ask myself the question, why did we do that? How did this even come about? What is uh, the historical background? This is something that has to be addressed as well. And this is uh, where huge riches have uh, been Raised. Uh, I have been raised in the eastern part of Germany, and I had an uncle in uh, western Germany. He was a 
he fulfilled a leading position in uh, the producing companies. Uh, he didn't want to have anything to do with me, but this uh, would uh, lead to far. Maybe we should enter more into complexity because uh, other than that, uh, it is uh, talking about the same things uh, over and over again. We, we won't really proceed if we keep on talking about the same issues. And the last question here from the first one. Lavinia Rovaret uh, from the German uh, Nature Protection Ring. And very interesting discussion. Unfortunately, we have uh, this um, um, conformity, this uh, unison that you have here on the panel is not really reflected in our policies. Um, so how can we proceed in the governments? Um, we have many different uh, strategies and laws that have uh, failed nationally, internationally. Uh, Ms. Lombardi said we need an Asian international agreement. Uh, so how do you think that we can push this forward? And the last... Uh, Question from the lady here in the front. Danke. Ingrid Apel, zwei Ingrid Apel, I have two questions. Uh, first uh, to Martin Häusling. Maybe you're not part of the right alliances or in the board of directors. So why do we have this bad balance? You were talking about shocking and alarming. So um, what what have uh, we done wrong, and what others? Uh, what do the others do right? I mean arguments, evidence, the facts and figures, they are there. People are dying, animals are dying, so so what's what else is there to say? I mean, we can keep on talking about it 10 more years. Um, so how do you want to, to uh, get to win the elections uh, and how could you maybe change the framing? It would be good for you as a Green Party and for us as a society. And then uh, secondly, uh, Ms. Bolmore, Kenya. Facts and figures, once again, uh, how many farmers are there who switch to organic farming and who is financing those farmers uh, that uh, offer the training? So maybe we can get away a bit from the general facts. We all know the facts. We have to, um, we have to be a bit more precise in terms of uh, taking action. What can we do? OK, I will take the liberty to tell you that uh, we will have a time afterwards so during our break. So questions, export ban, where are we? How can we proceed in this very difficult situation? What does it mean for the national reduction strategy? And uh, concrete questions about financing, circa maybe. And um, for the closing road, I would uh, take along the question of uh, how do we proceed? How do we move forward? I would like uh, to start uh, with the regulation. A regulation has been uh, issued, um, an ordinance, sorry, has been issued uh, last year, and uh, they're still negotiating in the ministries. We don't really receive any precise answers. Yesterday, in the high-level panel in the GFFA, we were talking about it. They're saying we see um, um, parties blocking the negotiations, but uh, we don't really know yet uh, what the outcome will be. How about financing of the trainings in Kenya? Uh, it's the farmers themselves who pay for the trainings. So it's extremely cheap. We have 100 farmers on the field, and simply by the sheer number of participants, it is worthwhile doing it. And then there is another financing means. Biovision is quite active as an association in Kenya and in Eastern Africa. And then we have another huge association that is growing. It is uh, the largest network in Africa with uh, the highest number of organizations. The African Food Sovereignty Association that um, are gaining in members that are offering these trainings, are offering these trainings even free for cost. So those are the facts. I'm sorry, cannot really deliver any more facts. How do we proceed? National reduction strategy, international agreements. If I may. Somebody was uh, raising some criticism that we did not respect uh, the historical background sufficiently or did not show sufficient solutions. Yes, partly I, I do agree. 
in this forum in the situation here in the situation we find ourselves in now here on the panel of course we cannot really cover it all we cannot start from after the war and then take an outlook to the next century so this would simply be uh, um, too much but uh, you're absolutely right and I've tried to raise that issue that uh, of course we cannot work without agriculture. We need a better agriculture in terms of biodiversity because this is uh, such a, a grave issue that has not reached uh, the policy makers yet. And uh, I do have to do some work. Even myself and my own party people don't really grasp the uh, extent of the problem. But uh, we are here at a point of time where we uh, try to get a grip with it. Um, if we spiral it up, dependencies will raise, the food uh, security and sovereignty situation will not change. If we look at uh, the cereal market, I think it's uh, five companies that uh, control the market with 80 percent they have their own fleet. And this is something that has grown. This is uh, the consequence of uh, a wrongly led uh, agricultural policy on the EU level and worldwide. And now we are, uh, the European elections are coming up and uh, of course we have to make clear to our voters uh, what has been done so far and what uh, possible solutions are. And solutions are to get together because it's going to be difficult when our farmers uh, say from one day to the other that we will switch to organic farming. This is not possible. It's not going to work, and the market is not there. So it's not possible to change everything overnight. But we can take decisions that um, uh, make decisions that uh, go down a different way. And this is why I try to do, I try to commit myself and uh, that uh, those uh, resolutions that are taken are implemented on the ground. And I come from a region where we have a huge uh, bird sanctuary. And um, just lately, I read in the newspapers that uh, um, the uh, um, defenders are for what has been decided in Brussels. And this is used in Europe. Uh, Dr. Lieser from uh, the Liberal Party uses this as, as an alibi. Even those who are um, natural protection defenders um, are in favor of what we are doing. And I know those people. I am from the region. And uh, what is lacking? Yes, uh, the natural protection uh, measures have shown some progress, but at the same time, we need a limitation strategy. We cannot keep on working the way we did right now, like, well, up until now. And how do we proceed? We have to work together with the farmers that are willing to receive something from what they do for society. The uh, uh, agricultural policy, the common agricultural policy has to be changed and uh, we can only achieve that if we have a certain, we have the back of um, our society. And uh, I won't change my mind even if we have. Why is this against? I'm sorry, we do not hear anything with that microphone. Wir können das leider im Zoom nicht verstehen, wenn Sie ohne Mikro reden. Okay, der, 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 der Kommentar war für, für den Zoom. Okay, the comment for Zoom, our listeners from Zoom. Wir können auch gleich beim Empfang noch weiter darüber diskutieren. That it was quite alarming what we've heard. Larissa. Yes, I would mention, uh, it's about what uh, can we do. We are working. Uh, in an uh, international alliance, which is called the IPSA, I-P-S-A, International Pesticides Standard Alliance, which aims to discuss and to propose an international framework for pesticides, because we do believe, of course, it's not the only solution, you know, the solution also comes from the social movements and etc. But I, I, we think that we need an, at international level the same roles for the whole world, which in the end the main uh, goal is to, to stop, to phase out it. These, uh, the use of these substances to organize how we can deal with this, 
how we can do it, but we need to do it. That's why we are working on this alliance, which was launched last year in March in New York because of the Water Conference, UN Water Conference. And we are going to have another UN conference on water issues next May. And we are putting all together people from different, uh, uh, the five continents. Hopefully, it will be an important uh, step. Vielen Dank, Larissa, für den Ausblick. Um, Many thanks, Larissa, for this uh, outlook. Maybe, Susan, first of all, then you have the um, last word. I did like the question of uh, how do we get into action if there's no unison, if we are not, if, if there's no overall agreement. And... Um, and uh, in Europe, we always said we are the front runners with the strongest pesticide law. They have pushed things forward. And now I think this is receding. And uh, internationally, voices have uh, been heard that who is going to be the next front runner from the global south. People were saying that. So the international sphere is uh, playing the ball back to us, where they have seen Kunming. Now it's a ball about the indicators. And uh, if uh, this works out like SOAR, and we have a totally misleading indicator in order to display a pesticide reduction that uh, now really on the shorter end. So we think and we hope that the community will establish the right indicators. And then there is a linkage um, to other UN institutions. Um, the new targets were phase out of those highly hazardous pesticides is included, were active. Um, Subsidy is uh, or support is mentioned, and where we have very strong and uh, harsh uh, lobby negotiations. Um, where we find different representatives from the different countries uh, that do have quite contrary viewpoints, uh, the industry, the civil society, and they come together in order to find a solution. Maybe this is a model we can go back to on the European and on the international level. Many things. Carsten wanted to add one last sentence. I have to. Yes, this is... Uh, very hard to swallow. Yes, I am here because I want to defend my position. And I'm a representative of many other people working as volunteers who want to change something. And we have this cooperation with farmers uh, as well in our region. And it is going down the right direction. We have to get together. It's not going to work without farmers. So we have to talk to one another. This is quite difficult right now. But I'm here because I want to reach out. I want to have a, a public sphere. There might be other people having different positions, but uh, it has to be expedient. And um, in terms of my analysis, I might uh, be marked a bit by working on that study. I'm seeing that uh, we are not moving in the right direction. Yes, there are different solutions. Um, Breeding, uh, the water cooperation, cooperation in terms of uh, soil protection, those are very good approaches and we have to push them forward and this will then lead to further success because this is how a dynamism, a dynamic can be initiated. Uh, don't have the time to dig further into it. Martin. Here we're referring to the historical background. Um, I can tell you something about my own historical background. I uh, took over the company of my parents in 1987. And then uh, to the huge surprise of my parents, that I would transition to organic farming. Um, people were afraid. When you were a generation that had been raised after the war, you were totally convinced by the new technologies. And my father said, uh, well, we just sprayed once and all the weeds were gone. Um, now it's, it's all so much easier. Do you remember what we had to do manually before getting rid of all the weeds? And now you want to go back to that? So this was the image that uh, people used to have. Um, no use of chemical substances anymore and back to the post-war period. And, 
My father is dead already, but uh, he recognized that it is possible. There is technology, more mechanical means. Um, there is a lot of uh, help uh, from the consumers who did want to buy that. Uh, people were thinking nobody would even buy that. It doesn't even taste good. So there were a huge uh, amount of prejudice. And you wouldn't think that this generation is not there anymore. The average age of the German farmer is 55 years plus. Many are coming back or coming from the um, generation that um, uh, think that this really was uh, um, a blessing to count on the new technologies. And we have to make them more aware. This is a slow process. And if you say you're sitting in the parliament since the 90s, you didn't change that at all. So what's the problem? Then, of course, uh, we have to bring our voters on board. If we don't have the majorities, uh, then, of course, we cannot really count on any change. 90% of our um, members of the European Parliament are not from the Green Party. So and they were thinking uh, um, with um, um, Frau von der Leyen that uh, farm to fork would work out and everything would change. But uh, since this whole business model is at stake, then of course everything that is in favor of it defends the business. So who wants uh, to be in favor of organic farming is a huge loss for Bayer and BASF. So of course so we need our lobby. This is a billion a billion dollar business. So okay, to tell me do do change something. I mean. Look around how many people are here. Can we really reach the majorities in our society? And I, of course, will try my best to do that. But is it possible to make agriculture and organic farming the central issue of the next European elections? Many people are thinking about uh, their lives becoming more expensive, to be endangered by a right-wing movement. Um, maybe it's not their first and foremost priority. When I started out doing organic farming in Hessen, 0.2 percent of the farms were organic. Now we have more than 17 percent. It's still not 20 or 30, but it's progressing. And it's, this only works out if uh, we take into consideration one thing. Whenever organic farming is more expensive than conventional farming because the production is different, then people find themselves in the supermarket making their decision. Why do I have to pay four times as much for an organic chicken? Because we don't take into consideration that our environmental consequences are simply not taken into account and not priced in. And those environmental um, consequences have to be part of the price. And I'm sure that the organic chicken will be cheaper than the conventional chicken. This is not something that we do in our politics. In Brussels, we try to shift subsidies to other areas, but this won't be sufficient. We have to get away from factory farming. We have to get away from industrial farming. But this means, and I have to tell you clearly, we won't be able to make our purchases as uh, cheap as that. And then the question, are you going to be on board? Are you going to be willing to buy organic products? Because I do something for my health, for the environment, and for all the others. And I think we weren't able to bring across that message, that our personal purchase decision is a decision for everything. <coughs> Thank you, Martin. I think uh, we closed quite uh, Similarly, um, only with the parenthesis that we need the right social policy in order for everybody being able to afford organic products. I think we have all learned our lesson here about the impact of um, chemical pesticides. We have heard how the lobby are still blocking and stopping the change. But we have had a few positive outlooks uh, from Brazil, from Kenya, how the um, Agroecology is growing and uh, have uh, shown uh, possibilities of regulation. And I have the honor now to invite you. Thank you so much to the office of Martin Häusling. They have um, provided a small snack uh, when you go down the stairs and next to the cafeteria. We have uh, room for networking, for exchange. And as announced um, afterwards, uh, the presentations will be made available for you to look into and the different studies. And there is a lot of material that you will find on the table outside that you can, of course, uh, grab and take home. Thank you so much uh, to our technicians. And uh, I wish you all a 
nice rest of the day and uh, happy Green Week. Thank you so much for the moderation and thanks to the Heinrich Böll Foundation for the great cooperation. Wish you a nice day. Bye-bye.